just want to say thank you to UKCCSRC because whilst this is a relatively small grant, um, it is perfectly timed and it's enabled us to get a foot in the door uh, with Drax as partners and Promethean Particles as well. And we'll just talk a bit about where we've got to. Um, and I think it's fair to say it's been COVID delayed and uh, we are just about to start our testing phase. So just to explain the purpose of the project, um, we are using solid sorbents in the form of metal organic frameworks. Uh, so the picture that you can see there are, is one particular type of metal organic framework. And I'll explain a little bit about how they work uh, in a minute. But the whole purpose here is to go to what we consider to be TRL5 for solid sorbents. It's a small trial, but we are using real flue gas. So from our perspective, we're actually moving up the TRL levels. And uh, what we're learning at the moment has been a steep and uh, fast learning curve, but I think we're um, at the point of being able to uh, do some CO2 capture at meaningful levels. So if you don't know what metal organic frameworks are, MOFs, um, they are highly porous materials. So they're nanostructured. They have micropores or mesopores. And uh, I used to teach 25 years ago to my students that the maximum theoretical limit for a material is 3,000 square meters a gram. It's good that I'm old enough now to have, have seen that completely wiped off the, uh, the, the theory now around what MOFs, the, the maximum surface area is colossal. And it's created entirely by a metal center and an organic ligand, which is then connected to create highly ordered porous structures. So where does Promethean particles come into this? Where is Chris? Can I just, can you just stand? Um, unfortunately, my chairman has decided that 10 o'clock is a good time for a board meeting. So I will literally be doing this presentation and leaving before the last speaker, sorry. But Chris um, is, uh, works for Promethean particles. So if any of this is interesting, uh, you can catch him after the, uh, after the session. But they have a thousand ton plant for making moths. So pretty large scale. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not the end of the story, but we've certainly de-risked the technology um, to make a, a large scale plant. So this was built a few years ago. Um, this is the reason why moths have never got anywhere. And it's not, I'm not saying it's Sigma Aldridge's fault because they sell these things, but it's the cost. If you look at the cost, if, if you want to spend 400 pounds on 10 grams of material, it's fairly unlikely you're going to want to play around making pellets out of it. Uh, and if you want a kilo, because you want to make pellets out of it, that's going to cost you a, 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 uh, about £20,000, which is the reason why nobody's ever done anything. It's why who's got that kind of money? Uh, and who would make a persuasive case if you're trying to spend £20,000 a kilo uh, on a material where you're going to need tons, thousands of tons of this material? So the reason why that's a significant uh, image there is because we've dropped orders of magnitude of the cost, which is why I think uh, Chris would very much like to talk to you if you're interested. So um, this is just a, a, T, a TGA uh, a profile just showing how we're measuring performance. And uh, there are a few people in the room that are doing this as well. You can pump in uh, controlled gas atmospheres into materials into MOFs, and you can look at the CO2 uptake. So essentially, uh, what you can see there, um, this is the point where we're at the right kind of temperature for adsorption, and uh, you can see rapid adsorption. Uh, this is a, always an interesting number because it gives you some sense of performance in terms of weight percent uptake. Uh, but then uh, what you can do is cycle it over and over again. So you don't have to wait. In this case, my, I pointed out to my student, why would we want to spend two hours doing one cycle? when we really want to be doing thousands of cycles. So we've developed a system that can do 30,000 cycles in about a month. So if you're a MOF developer uh, and you're interested in knowing how robust it is, then that's something that we could probably help you with as well. Um, because nobody's going to want to spend uh, two hours per cycle. You're really going to want to spend minutes per cycle. So concept around uh, what we're developing is temperature swing, pressure swing, equally valid, although yesterday there was some interesting comments about the modeling of it. So in just again, if this is a, a novel concept uh, for one or two, uh, we might use the flue gas to heat up a column that's already preloaded with CO2 in the MOF uh, to cool down the gas. That gas will then pass through a, uh, a decharge or discharged uh, MOF column, MOF uh, pellet column, and then that gas will pass through. So what you really, uh, if you choose the right MOF, you get selectivity. So in this case, you'll get MOF um, certain MOFs, like aluminium fumarate, the world's worst selective uh, MOF for 
CO2 capture that will just absorb any gas at all. Uh, in, the, in other cases, they're highly selective and actually it will just preferentially strip out the CO2 and allow all the other gases, which is the big question, because clearly real flu gas has got lots of different gases, gas molecules in it, uh, but preferentially strip out the CO2. And at this point, once it's fully charged, hopefully you've got a very um, reduced CO2 flow out, and then you just swing it back and you heat up that column to drive out the CO2. And this, on the basis, this is supposed to be a nine minute talk. There's no time to carry on showing you the rest of that animation. So um, as well, if you're developing MOS, one of the, we're just about to publish a paper on uh, showing how you can take a batch formulation to full scale production at continue, with a continuous technology in three months. And we've done this using AI. So this is where we've got a, a system, uh, that side, uh, we've got our reactor, we've got pumps, and we've got a detector system. In this case, we used FDIR. And the FDIR essentially interrogates the product that's coming out in flow and then makes decisions about what to change. So it's not design of experiments. It's way smarter than that. It uses Bayesian algorithms so that it can actually uh, start to adjust the temperature, the pressure, the flow concentration to actually uh, create the best product. So you're not interfering. You're just letting it get on with it. And it can do you know, dozens and dozens of, of samples per day. Uh, there's an image there of us collecting a nice blue one. So the way that that works, uh, this is aluminium fumarate, just as an example, but we wanted to have a product, we define what the product should look like, and then it actually works out from the variables how to do that. Uh, so it's way quicker, which is, uh, say, if you're developing your own MOFs, it might be something that you want to consider, because if you can do it in batch, we can probably turn it to a continuous process. And in doing that, you need to optimize it. And this is how you do it. Uh, so this, these are just five different MOFs looking at that uptake again. So the big peak is where it's actually taking up CO2. Um, clearly the red one, I've chopped off what they are for various reasons, but the red one's really good. Uh, the yellow one is actually, um, it's not actually the best capacity that really counts. It's actually the performance in real conditions that's gonna count. So we may have the world's best MOF for capturing CO2, but it might just work for one cycle. You have to find the best one for performing over 20,000 cycles, two years. Um, so various other things that we played around with um, is, uh, that's not aspirin, by the way, that's aluminium fumarate. Uh, it's not the best moth because it's white. Lots of other moths have got nice colors to it, but we, we have to start playing around doing breakthrough tests uh, at small scale. Um, making these pellets has been fun. Um, this was the squeaky bum moment a few weeks ago. So you can see a nice advert for the, for the project. This is where you're hoping that the forklift truck guy cares about as much about what's on his pallet as, as you do. Um, this was just installing it at the incubator site at, um, at Drax. There was at least two inches to spare on either side of the gate. So we were quite pleased about that. So that's now installed. Things that we're really excited about and still don't really fully understand, new morphologies of moths. Um, if you can give me a, a name for what you can see on the right-hand side, I, we're still really freaking out about that. That's, uh, this, is a, this is a flow method, making materials with three dimensions. It's very unusual, and I've been working on it for 20 years. Uh, to see things like this very recently uh, is pretty unusual, 100 times bigger than the normal moths that we, that we make as well. And the reason why size is important in this case is because performance over long periods of time uh, is partly dictated by particle size. And a lot of moths, they're less than uh, one micron, and they don't tend to last uh, because they're just not robust enough, thermally robust enough for the cycling. So uh, working on different morphologies has been part of the, the project too. Um, there's some experts in the room and probably in the other uh, parallel sessions on modeling this. And this is part of the, the Picasso project, but we can't re we've started to develop our own model for, for understanding how we compare in terms of energy penalty versus amine scrubbers. But we don't really know enough yet. We've, we've, we've got the kind of basics, but until we get the cycling data, the uptake data, um, I think it's pretty fair to say that we, we don't really know um, how, um, how we compare. Early data suggests it's pretty good. But this is early data and it's extrapolated. Um, and clearly the jury is out on, on which technology is going to move forward. And it's pretty, it's pretty likely, actually, that we'll get many technologies either working together or relevant to certain industries. You'll get a certain technology, uh, but we're yet to see. So it's exciting times. OK, so um, making MOFs is getting a lot cheaper. Uh, 
Um, if any of you would like to buy at least a ton, we can give you a very, very good price. Um, but if you would like to buy less, I'm sure Chris is amenable to negotiation. Um, it's pretty clear that certain MOFs uh, have been developed. They're very good for CO2. Some of them are terrible for CO2, and there's a lot yet to be discovered. There's almost an infinite combination of, of materials that could be created. And in terms of the overall technology, the way that it's going to work, uh, it's still unsure. And the Picasso project uh, technically is finished, but it's just starting. Uh, so we've got two months worth of, of work at uh, Drax at the incubator site to develop um, cycling data. Uh, using various MOFs and various technologies as well, which weren't actually on the forklift if you saw the video very carefully. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ed. Um, so has anyone got any questions for Ed? First of all, in the room, and I'll go on this side, and I'll see if there's any online as well. MOF is amenable to operating with a wet Oh, figure. okay. So uh, the, the first MOF that we're working with is not the best one for moisture, but we've kind of put a cheat in there because we're developing various other MOFs that are way better with uh, moisture, but we're, they were a little bit far behind in terms of mass production, but we've cracked that now. So the first installation is going to be, uh, we're going to have to be quite careful as to how it works. But you're right, the biggest challenge with MOFs is uh, moisture sensitivity. But there are certain MOFs like aluminium fumarate, fantastic, will hang in there um, with as much moisture as you like all day long. Uh, HCUS won't like moisture. Uh, UTSA 16, which was uh, presented yesterday um, by a colleague from Imperial at the top there, um, is, is fantastic with moisture as is CALF 20. So they, are, they do exist, but um, the big challenge is switching from what is batch chemistry to, to continuous, which is why, again, if there are people working in this field, we'd very much like to talk to you. One at the top there, please. Bet the microphone guy is really click, pleased that <laughs> questions are from the top. Uh, um, just a question. Um, you need some sort of the flu. Oh, uh, no, I mean, in the end, it's got to go in, hasn't it? You've got to put it in. And one of the big questions is what happens when you've got gas, a gas comp, a very complex gas composition that comes from. A particular technology. So BEX is one thing, but they're clearly if you're burning certain other fuels, you're going to get other compositions. If you've got a gas turbine, your CO2 rating is really low. If you're doing DAX, then you're down to 400 and something parts per million. Um, so it's, it's, I think this is where each technology is going to have advantages in certain sectors. But certainly there are MOFs that will work. And in principle, they've got to work in without any kind of huge penalty or pre-treatment because then you're, you're back to you know, the issues with Amy's covers where there's energy penalties. Questions. I haven't got anything online that I can see. I've got one. Uh, scalability. Do you see any scalability challenges um, and for various different scales of industries to apply this to? No. Good stuff. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> That's the benefit of the Picasso project and the design that we've come up with is em eminently scalable. So taking it to a thousand ton, it's not a problem. It's just a container instead of a barrel. Uh, and that, that this, these are the big questions. Uh, people have been held up with, oh, crap, uh, MOFs cost so much money. How do we ever develop it? Well, we'll make a little bit in the lab. But then, you, you know, nobody worried about making pellets because who had enough to make pellets? So now you're making pellets. You start to think, OK, well, if we can make pellets, we could do this, we could do that. So there's all the questions that, are, that have never been asked because nobody has had the, the capacity or scale to make the material in the first place. They are, they are now fast uh, arriving. And I think that's where there's going to be some really interesting IP coming from this room, probably, as to how these solutions will work now that making this stuff and the performance of this stuff is, is guaranteed. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You. If you've got no more questions, we'll give Ed one more thanks and then we'll um, introduce the next couple. So for the next speaker, we have Ben Petrovich, who is a postdoctoral research, uh, doctoral researcher, not quite yet, not quite yet, um, looking at biomass uh, combustion ash in carbon capture, and he's from Brunel University. Now he's going to actually, we're going to do a bit different, I like a big, good double act myself personally, we've got one coming up later after this, um, with uh, the next speaker, who is Mike um, Gabornov. Hey, hey, got you. So who's also from Brunel, but their projects are very much related. So we're going to have one after the other. So we'll have Ben first and Mike, and then we'll have the Q&A joint with them because it's likely there's going to be a bit of crossover there. Okay, so welcome, Ben. 
Yeah, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what we were doing as part of the uh, 2021 flexible funding, uh, looking at the applications of biomass combustion ash and CO2 capture. So the concept of bioenergy with carbon capture storage, or BEX, is something I'm sure is quite familiar. Um, that was anticipated to become quite a big share of that low carbon energy supply. The issue lies in the fact that a lot of that energy comes from the combustion of biomass. Um, so look at Drax, as it previously mentioned, so they burn white wood pellets. Um, which is a significant amount of biomass combustion ash produced from that. So if you look at um, potential you know, wood biomass that's produced with energy applications, um, this sits somewhere annually between five and six uh, gigatons, five and eight gigatons. If we assume you know, a mean combustion ash yield of somewhere around 6.8%, this could lead to you know, around 500 million tonnes of biomass combustion ashes annually. It's not so much of an issue if you look at you know, coal ashes, they have their applications. The problem lies in the fact that these ashes have a significant or an elevated concentration of alkaline, alkaline earth metals, which render things like cementitious applications not really suitable. Um, so what we're trying to do is to try and use that ash within that CCS aspect of BEX, um, one, to, to try and make, you know, avoid the, the landfilling cost uh, but also any environmental concerns because the same properties that make them or limit their applications in cement um, could also make them beneficial for things like adsorption. Um, so yeah, so we've been using ash from Drax. They burn white wood uh, pellets. So we're looking at two fractions: the lighter elements of the fly ashes um, and the bottom ash. So as an adsorbent, so typically depending on you know what this ash is made up of, we have three trains of thought. So the first are class C ashes, which have you know an elevated concentration of calcium. Obviously, that calcium would lend itself to something like dicarbonation. Um, without that calcium, and say more of the iron oxide, silicon, alumina. Um, exploiting those um, components to make sense something like mesoporous silicas or zeolites. Um, the third classification, not really a typical classification, but ashes would have a high carbon content. So with that logical thought would just be to extract that carbon and then activate it. So obviously to try and inform that, you need to first characterize it. So the fly ash is quite unremarkable, quite similar to a coal ash. Um, you see the synospheres, they're typical of the abrupt cooling post-combustion. Um, what's interesting slightly is that the BET surface area is slightly towards the upper limit of where you'd expect for coal ashes, um, but it's more the composition. So we have around 8.5% calcium um, present in this. So obviously the first thing we tried to try and use it for direct carbonation, but when you consider that this ash is produced in you know, a fairly high temperature, high CO2 environment, those calcium species are going to exist as a, a calcium carbonate. So in the context of post-combustion, there's not really a huge scope for any further immobilization. Obviously, looking at the aluminium silicon, it's not that high, but there's still a significant amount. Um, and to try and exploit as much of that as possible, the next logical um, route was to try and make a zeolite from it. So with this, we used uh, an alkaline fusion-assisted hydrothermal method, which essentially just means mixing the sodium hydroxide with fly ash, um, then fusing this at 550 degrees in a muffle furnace, pulverizing this and then mixing with deionized water um, and stirring it for 16 hours, and then treating this at 90 degrees in a sealed vessel um, four hours at 90 degrees. Obviously just cooling this and separating it and washing it to pH of seven, we then end up with a zeolitic material at the end. The other material, so the biomass bottom ash. So this typically has three constituents. So we have the unburnt biomass, which you can see quite clearly in you know, the, the brown elements to that on the left. Um, the ash, which is probably quite similar to the fly ash, um, just on a smaller concentration and also the unburnt carbon, which is obviously what we look to extract. So trying to use a, the simplest method as possible, we essentially dried it, manually ground it, and then sieved it to try and remove the larger elements of that. So the carbon on the right is actually the smallest fractions. Um, so obviously you're going to have the ash in that as well, um, but depending on how much is there, you still have a significant amount of carbon. In terms of characterization of that carbon derived from the bottom ash, um, it's definitely carbon. Um, there is still around 7% of ash within that, as you can see also in the SEM, so you still see some of the xenospheres. Um, but... BT surface area is quite poor. Um, what was more interesting or slightly interesting is that you know the spectroscopy results did indicate there does seem to be some crystalline carbon there, um, but that's quite uninteresting. So with regards to performance, so just looking at on, on the TGA under a stream of pure CO2 at 50 degrees, although the capacity or equilibrium capacity for the fly ash derived zeolite is a little bit better, the kinetics are quite poor. Um, so if you look at the carbon, so considering the low PET surface there, 2.6 or 2.8 square meters per gram, the capacity is still pretty good for that. Um, but what's more interesting is it reaches that capacity within around five minutes. So there's a huge scope for improvement if we then increase that surface area and then surface modify it. In terms of conclusions of this, um, so we just looked to try and evaluate different routes um, 
for actually implementing biomass combustion ash in post-combustion carbon capture and then trying to prove different concepts in terms of easily extracting that carbon from it um, and then synthesizing other materials from the fly ash. Obviously, there's still a significant need for improvement in terms of capacity and performance. So what we look to do, which is what Mike's going to talk about, is one, improve the zeolite crystallinity and purity, um, and also look at activating that extracted carbon. And then with that, we can then look into you know, whether it's even a viable option. So I've been told to try and blow our own horns a little bit as well. So um, we published two conference proceedings um, and also quite a lengthy review paper at the end of 2021, which is still, I think, one of the most analytical articles in the last 90 days. I um, just want to say thank you as well, because it's the first funding we had from the UK CCSRC, so we're quite grateful for that. Um, I think with that, I shall hand over to Mike. Hello. So, yes, how uh, exactly how Ben has said, my name is Mike, and the presentation that I'm going to be delivering today is the continuation of the first project that we have received as a group. So we're building upon the first flexible funding with the other one, and this time, this is a still ongoing project, but we're going to be evaluating the techno-economics of biomass combustion products in the synthesis of effective, uh, yet low-cost adsorbents for carbon capture. So the proof-of-concept study has been conducted, and now we do understand to a large degree what we can potentially do with these um, biomass combustion ashes. So, But before we can analyze their techno-economics, we need to try to optimize, maximize their applicability and their uptake. So for that, we used two different designs of experiments. So for the zeolite, we built a Taguchi-based L9 matrix, uh, where we evaluated both the crystallization time and temperature, as well as the sodium hydroxide to fly ash ratio and the liquids to solid ratio. With the carbon, though, we used a uh, more, more evolved, shall we say, design. It was a mixed level design, as you can see. And it had more factors. Some of them were, well, one of them was qualitative and the others were quantitative. Uh, let's start with the zeolite because it's uh, probably an easier point to start with. So building upon what Ben has shown you just now in the proof of concept zeolite, we have, eval we have changed a little bit the evaluated factors and levels. And within that, we have then found the optimum point effectively doubling the capacity at 50 degrees Celsius, which is, in our understanding, quite a good thing to do. <laughs> but for the carbon, since we evaluated five different factors and uh, one of them was a qualitative design, we decided to do a two-step optimization. So the first one was to evaluate just them, the L25 mixed level design. And our findings were quite interesting because... So we found that only three out of those five factors were statistically significant. And with quite a high confidence level, we can say that all well, the gas is statistically significant, which could be anticipated because it's the only qualitative factor and of course, changing from CO2 to nitrogen uh, impacts the activation process as well. Then the activation temperature was also quite important, also easy to be anticipated and especially if we take into account the proposed reaction mechanism for the CO2 activation, which is the reverse boudoir reaction, it becomes increasingly, the temperature becomes increasingly important because at very high temperatures of around 900 degrees Celsius, we do not produce an activated carbon. We effectively just burn it all away. So we have a zero uptake with a minuscule yield and the material which we take out of the furnace, it's not black as carbon, it's gray as ash. And we confirmed that with FTIR and SEM further down. But what was interesting here is that, and let's say counterintuitive, is that the activation time was not statistically insignificant, whereas the ramp rate was significant. That suggested to us that the actual activation procedure, the development of the porosity occurs at a lower level than was previously evaluated within this study. So for our second step, we decided to use a central composite design or a CCD because it would allow us to peak outside of that initial boundary of 700 degrees that we set out to have a look at 679. Um, and that's well exactly what we did. The only problem is that uh, central composite designs and well, box back and designs, these type of designs, they do not allow for an incorporation of a, a qualitative factor within quantitative factor. So it was effectively not one big design, but two separate, but very similar designs. And our results show that the optimum points are quite close to one another, shall we say, and 
at the very low ramping rate, further suggesting that there is other potential to decrease the temperature for the activation whilst increasing the actual hold time, the activation time that was statistically insignificant within the evaluated matrix um, on the first part of the optimization process. The performance of these two materials uh, capture-wise was quite similar. It was hard to distinguish between one another. So we went with a CO2 activated sample because the temperature that used for activation was lower. So that'll be a lesser energy requirement for the actual uh, production procedure. Plus, since this is in the middle of the design temperature, why shall we say the CO2 activated sample suggests, as I said, further potential for decreasing the activation temperature without hampering the adsorption capacity. And so our three materials can be seen here on these slides. Indeed, as I said, we doubled the capacity of the zeolite from our proof of concept study to our, uh, let's say, optimum performance and the optimum sample. And uh, the same can be said about the virgin carbon and the activated carbon. Uh, what is also quite interesting is that the kinetics have been also improved for the zeolite alongside with its crystallinity. And now you can see that it reaches the um, uptake within the 30 minutes instead of the two hours that was done within the um, proof of concept study. So the techno-economics are not as uh, evolved as the rest of it because this is still an ongoing study. But what we can say as of now that for both of the materials, there are similar benefits. Firstly, it's the lack of any logistics or transportation costs, because if they are to be implemented on site for in situ decarbonization of the um, power plant, you're going to save between 3 and 10%, depending on uh, different publications and different estimations. Another quite important point, which Ben highlighted, is the waste valorization, not just of the environmental aspect, although BASE has published a... I think in November 2021, published a uh, policy statement on BEC's waste minimization, something along those lines. But that would also decrease the landfilling costs that the power plant has. And not only did your gas bill rise on the 1st of April, also did the rates for the um, uh, landfill tax, shall we say. So the standard rate now went up to 98.6 pounds per ton, whereas the lower rate is 3 pounds 15 pence per ton. Now, these two points are applicable to both of the materials. However, with the carbon, there are some additional points that I would like to highlight. So for the bottom ash derived carbon, the top fraction of the um, um, generated during, or rather produced during the extraction process is effectively unburned biomass. So it's just that wood pellets, or rather wood pieces that could be then readily introduced into the boiler. And that will increase the overall efficiency on the, of the plant. On the other hand, they could be used in the standalone unit to actually, well, hopefully provide all of the energy needed, but at least significantly decreasing the energy penalty that is associated with um, the regeneration of the solvent. Plus, if that, uh, if that uh, top fraction is going to be reclaimed and using it in the boiler, that's going to further reduce the quantity of ash needed for landfill. So another environmental and a monetary benefit for the company. For this carbon as well, another point is the absence of a uh, carbonation step because normally when you're evaluating a waste to activate a carbon process, first you have a pyrolysis step, which takes, which accounts from between 20 and 40 percent, depending on the conditions and everything, of the uh, total final price of the carbonaceous, of the activated carbon. So without this, this is also going to constitute a big monetary saving. Uh, further down, we can say that physical activation with CO2 in this case is cheaper and more eco-friendly than the chemical activation, which is also a good point. And there's no, so yeah, no secondary pollution as well from that, plus the potential to lower the activation temperature even further. And another thing to propagate the ideas of a uh, circular and green economy is that if we're going to activate it with CO2, then we can use the captured CO2 to be recycled uh, the captured CO2 to be recycled back to be the activating gas in the furnace. So um, not only Ben has been told to play up how good we are, uh, we have published another uh, review paper over there, and we currently have uh, four other uh, papers under review. So hopefully 
by our next conversation, they will move from the one of the columns to the others. And with that, I would like to as well thank UKCCSRC and EPSRC for this funding, as well as send a special thanks to Dr. Peter Clough and Sarah Bosman for all their help that they have, uh, for all their contributions to our research, as well as Dr. Jenny Ree from Drax UK for her continued support. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike and Ben. Do you want to come on up and Ben? Good stuff. So have, let's open the floor up to uh, questions in the room. And I'll also shuffle again around this side so I can see if there's any questions come through online. Um, OK, so any questions before we kick off? Let me go. Thank you for a very uh, informative uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is mainly about the variable sites. So uh, you did try to, to see the uh, effect of these two solvents, fly ash base and the bottom. Did you try to see the effect of pressure on these uh, solvent first? And second is that, uh, did you try to compare these absorb uh, absorbent with the commercially available absorbent? Um. I'll take this question then. You're up for the next one. I mean, in terms of like pressures, you mean as in the fly ash as, as, it's, as itself or the, der the derivative? I mean, the effect of pressure on like uh, how good, uh, if you increase the pressure, how good is the carbon dioxide uptake? No, we haven't. No, we've just done it atmospheric. Yes, yeah, so we, 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 we did not evaluate the adsorption, uh, the CO2 uptake at different pressures. No, yeah, so we're we using a TSA process. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we're also building a fixed bed where you can use the TSA sort of process to try and evaluate these in. You know, something's a bit more realistic than just the TGA, which is a bad metric, I think. For less than yes. <laughs> um, and to answer the second question, comparing it against a commercial sorbent um, for the activated carbon, yes, we did. And the performance of this material of the activated carbon, that the optimum activated carbon, is comparable. Uh, it is a little bit like marginally, I'd say. Well, I mean, point. 0.1 millimole per gram better than the activated carbon we had in our lab. But uh, there's still some room for improvement because I want to beat all of the activated carbons, not just that. With the zeolite, um, we did have a look at it on the uh, pellets that we had in the lab as well, but I Very don't think it's a fair right. comparison because uh, those, this was a powdered material, whereas the zeolite that we had was uh, beans. Or... Got another question up the top there, so right at the very top. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you've, you kind of mentioned it. How many sort of samples did you collect in terms of the bottom, the bottom ash and things? Did Drax provide you multiple samples over different days to see for, you know, consistency and I guess, yeah, whether the composition, for instance, of the samples were the same? Um, yes. So we have evaluated a, quite a big range of um, ashes collected at different times. They are some variations. We're trying to deal with them and make our uh, the processes that we have robust to material variation. But we have to take into account that, well, when working with waste, it's well, the nature. There's no quality control on the uh, input. So we there is a possibility that perhaps the capacity that we're going to have is going to be a little bit lower if, for example, the carbon is going to have a higher ash content or the fly ash is going to have uh, more of a carbon content to it might perhaps hamper as well the crystallinity of it but as of now we can't say that the variation from batch to batch is uh, a problem that we know a way around it except for just to <laughs> deal with it and agree with about decrease well not agree on decreasing uh, let's say get around get our heads around decreasing the um, Update. Interesting just to see those results to kind of report that variability just to kind of understand. Um, and then another question is uh, how much recovery did you get in terms of percentage wise of carbon from the bottom ash? So um, another thing which I wanted to add about the uh, variation of the bottom ash as well, we're evaluating uh, the right now we are looking at different uh, boilers. So we have collected ash from boiler one, two, three and Four, and we're trying to cross compare them to see if uh, maybe there's some variation within that. That might be another potential source of variation. Um, as for the carbon, the yield is not that big. It is uh, between six to 11%, depending on the day. Uh, but there is potential to increase that if we go a little bit higher, because um, as Ben said, the 
the fractions that we have, they are below some sort of a uh, threshold. And if we increase that mesh size, we increase the amount of material we produce. But as part of that would let us go up to 30%, I'd say, uh, mass wise. But that would then decrease, that would increase the ash content. So it's going to be a little dirtier as a carbon. Remainder would just be waste, would it? Or go to land? Because you were talking about waste minimization. Yes, effectively, effectively, uh, if we separate into three batches, shall we say, the top is going to be the bottom, uh, the biomass that can be reintroduced as fuel. The bottom would be the carbon and the medium. Uh, we don't yet have uh, a viable source that might still be sent to landfill or perhaps a further. Yeah, maybe as a filler, but that is also needs to be evaluated. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, right, if we've got any more questions, one more question, and then we'll we'll move on to the next speaker. Anyone else afterwards who can catch up in the coffee break? Hi, um, thanks for two really nice talks. Uh, I was wondering how much control you have over the topology and morphology in your zeolite synthesis, and is that then beneficial compared to kind of zeolites are made quite a lot in the lab? So is that then beneficial if you can't control it? Um, I think the key answer to that is that the objective wasn't to make a specific phase or a specific type of zeolite, just to try and make something that could actually adsorb CO2. Um, so I'm not really looking. So I think the, the one that we were talking about in this is actually a, a mixture of type A and X. Um, there are some quite novel morphologies in terms of like hierarchical zeolites. I think there's some twinning going on with the MT and photocyte. Um, but in terms of control over that, not really that easy because there's a lot of alkaline, alkaline um, metals within that you know, solution. Um, which I think are causing quite a lot of problems. But um, yeah, so not a lot of control. Okay, thank you. No thank you very much, guys. So if, if you can give one more round of applause and then we can, we can move on to the next one. And I think we're, we've caught up with time as well, which is great. Um, so next up, we've got a, we get double, double the sound stuck in the middle. Um, we've got Xin Liu from the University of Nottingham, who is going to, who is a PhD student, who's going to give you a presentation on scalability, step change, carbon materials, achieving high CO2 absor adsorption capacity, selectivity, a practical flue gas temperatures for potential breakthrough cost reduction. Good morning. Uh, I'm Sin from University of Nottingham. I'm so glad to be here to share the progress of our UK CCSRC and EPSRC pro funded project, um, developing carbon-based materials for post-combustion CO2 capture, we call that a step change carbon materials. We hope it can reduce the cost of the capture process. So first about the general background, why we choose activated carbon. Actually the state of the art um, capture technology is aiming scrubbing. It suffers from like a high energy penalty and the de uh, degradation of amines. Actually the cost is very high. I think the previous presentation had has make the choice, they use uh, physical solvents, morphs, the zeolite, and the carbons, because it shows the great potential in reduce the cost of the capture process. For us, we choose carbon as well. So why? Because it has some unique advantages, like for example, the low regeneration energy requirement is a potential to reduce a very, very low energy requirement, and also has a wide availability uh, of a precursor that also has a flexibility for surface functionalization and also have a high stability. However, for carbon materials, because it's a, the absorption is a physical absorption, actually the interaction between CO2 and the carbon surface, that is a weak interaction force, that is a one wise force. So it's very sensitive to temperature and also CO2 partial pressure. So the CO2 absorption capacity Definitely, it's very low at a realistic flue gas condition like a 40 to 50 degrees C, and also low CO2 concentration, about 15% CO2 in the flue gas. So the key is how to improve their CO2 absorption capacity, especially at a high temperature around 40 to 50 degrees C. That actually is the target of our project. So we want to develop a new type of carbon materials that has high CO2 absorption capacity and the selectivity especially at um, realistic flow gas condition, 40 to 50 degrees C and 15% uh, CO2. And we test many, many materials. And we finally, we found the best candidate from my supervisor's garage. Yeah, a type of a, a building insulation form that is, a, um, the name is a, um, polyisocyanate. Uh, 
that is a PIR foam or PRF. We call that a PRF. That is a type of uh, insulation material that has been widely used in a uh, building. Uh, so the aim of this project actually, we want to optimize the preparation process for this type of materials and try to scale up the production of the materials. So that is some major findings of our uh, project. The first, like we use a very simple compaction chemical activation process to produce those carbon materials. Like we mix those carbons with QH and then produce pellet and then do activation, finally get the carbon. We found the carbon actually is, ultra, uh, is extremely microporous and has a high volume of ultra micropores. And also it has a very unique 3D structures. So we test our sorbents using different techniques like TG and BAT. And we found very exciting results actually at 40 and 50 to 50 degrees C and the, the CO2 concentration 15% CO2 Actually, the, the absorption capacity of our carbon could reach 2 to 2 point millimole per gram. It's about 9 weight percentage. It's very high and maybe like a similar or even higher than some morphs and the zeolite. And also, it has a good working capacity when you use a pure CO2 as a sweeping gas and also good selectivity at 40 and 50, uh, 70 degrees C. So we want to know why, why this carbon is so special, like uh, why not other carbons like could achieve such high absorption capacity at 40 to 50 degrees C. So we characterized our sorbents with different techniques. Finally, we found that actually the surface functionality of those carbons, especially the potassium intercalation during the KOH activation process play the key role. So to, ad to identify the uh, rule of potassium, we subject our samples to further hot water washing. We use hot water to wash our samples for another two days and uh, try to remove most of the potassium from our carbon. And we found that after the, after the uh, washing, actually the ultra micropores, which play the key role for CO2 absorption at low partial pressure, did not change, but the, the potassium reduced a lot so the CO2 absorption capacity is sharply reduced. So uh, based on our surface potential analysis, we found that uh, the, the intercalated potassium could significantly increase the surface potential of those carbon materials. And so it can polarize the CO2 molecules and to enhance the, uh, the interaction force between carbon and CO2 and also can provide uh, extra absorption size for CO2. So it's like the, it's, the rule is like uh, the extra frameworks of uh, ions in zeolite and morphs. So next step, like uh, we try to scale up the production of those type of PIR, uh, PIF carbons and in our lab and also in our partner uh, lab, uh, CPL. But um, unfortunately, because of the limitations of some of the equipments, so we just modify the, the, the process, not like the small scale, like a gram scale production. So we produce like a kilograms, uh, kilogram scale uh, sorbents. Actually, the, the absorption capacity uh, reduced somewhat, but still good, but it reduced, uh, reduced. So we send those materials to our partner in Korea, Korea uh, uh, Institute of Energy Research. They will use their moving bath to test the CO2 absorption uh, performance uh, in their lab. Uh, Currently, the, 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 the test actually is still undergoing, so we have not received the results. So in addition to uh, PIR or uh, the PIR form and the PU form, actually, we also tried a different type of uh, plax, uh, plastic waste that is a non-degradable waste, like a phenolic, uh, phenolic resin form and the PVC and the e-waste. We found that the form-like structure actually is benefit to produce carbon with a high CO2 absorption capacity. And especially for those PIR, PU form that is nitrogen doped, maybe nitrogen does not play the key role, but like uh, the 3D structures of the PIR form and the PU form is better for the potassium intercalation. So the CO2 absorption capacity increased. So also like the PVC waste or E-waste, 
is not a good candidate for post-combustion CO2 capture, but we think um, to convert plastic waste to activated carbon could be a good way to recycle or reuse those non-degradable or non-reusable plastic waste. So we give two examples here. Here, this first one is PVC waste. Like uh, PVC has been widely used in our world uh, every, uh, for pipe, uh, pipe production and also like window profiles. It contains about a 40 weight percentage of uh, like uh, metal additives like uh, calcium and uh, titanium inside. So by using a simple KOH activation process plus acid washing, we could fully recover those calcium and also titanium uh, in the form of a solid salt. And also we can produce a very good carbon. It can be used uh, for environmental decontamination. And for the e-waste, we use a simple like a KOH activation process. We could convert them into a super carbon. So it's the surface area could, is extremely high up to 4,000 square meter per gram. And also the high power volume up to 2.1 a cubic centimeter per gram. We are now we're using those carbons to do like high pressure CO2 absorption. So thanks for the financial support from UKSSRC and uh, EPSRC. We, uh, our major findings have been published on uh, several um, international journals, including CEG and GMC. If you are interested in those results, you can find the details from those publications. And also the success of this project has also helped us to get funding from base for direct air capture. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Shin. So, any questions? Oh. <laughs> no, I'll kick off with one then. Um, so you finding for the ultra pause, you didn't uh, get any, um, I'm conscious of, there might be some questions on that side, so I'll go on there as well. Um, we didn't get very many dif uh, much difference at the ultra micro scale. Do you think that could be a diffusion element due to the pores sizes as well as the, the size of the CO2 traveling through or the water traveling through after you washed it, for example? Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, yeah. Uh, actually, like, uh, I think the, uh, as the, like the water washing, like we wash the potassium out, actually, like some of the pores, like, uh, uh, how to say that it's trapped there, and when you wash the potassium out, then it's become pores, and some of the pores become wider sometimes. Like this. But uh, for after the water wash, actually, we found that the uh, ultra micro pore definitely no change sometimes. Like this. Cool. Any questions? There we go. We've got someone at the top there. Thanks all for the presentation. Uh, just one question. Have you also tried to measure the selectivity of CO2 over nitrogen? Because at that conditions, the absorption capacity, I agree with you, is comparable with zeolite. And yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, and also the working capacity looks okay. The selectivity? Don't give me the, the selectivity. selectivity of CO2 over nitrogen at those conditions. Oh, yeah, the selectivity, we done that at uh, 40 and uh, 70 degrees C using 15% CO2 in helium. Yeah, like uh, the, uh, the, okay, I can show that. Okay, so the absorption of CO2, we use the a gas is a 15% CO2 in helium. So we got the absorption capacity of uh, CO2. And then we measured the nitrogen absorption capacity using like a, a like a, at a, as a similar temperature, then we got the ratio between the CO2 absorption capacity and the nitrogen absorption capacity. So the, that is a ratio, it's not a, like a RAST or different other selectivities. It's about uh, uh, for over 40, 40 to 100 or something, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Question, again? <laughs> um, so you used, um, I know it's 100% CO2? For your simulation? Uh, no, 15% CO2. 15% CO2, yes. okay. Because um, I was going to I was going to ask about contaminations and are you considering of looking at other contaminants that could like, potentially uh, impact? Gas, like a uh, uh, small like trace. Sulfur, something yep. like that. Yep. Actually, like uh, we are still working on that. Actually, mm -hmm. now we just use a simula simulated flue gas, just in nitrogen, CO2, or helium, something like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you haven't got any more questions, we shall uh, give Chin another round of applause and then we'll move on to the next final speaker. 
Okay, for our final speaker, we have uh, Dr. Vincenzo Spallina from the University of Southampton, and he is doing a presentation on the Clinching Project. Are you funded in 2018? I believe, yep. And it's uh, clinching projects is essentially clean hydrogen and chemical production by chemical looping. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm from University of Manchester, but it's okay. okay it's all right. Yeah, that's me. I'm still. No I'm still. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks, everyone, and uh, good morning. Um, so I'm here to present the results of the uh, clinching project, which stands for clean hydrogen and chemical production using uh, chemical looping. In this case, we are working on a, a dynamically operated packet bed reactor. I'm not actually sure if it's 2018 or 2019 uh, flexible funding, but anyway, it was one of the funding available from UK CCSRC, which I developed in collaboration with Advision and Johnson Mate uh, as a company. So during this presentation, I will briefly go through the uh, concepts, what were the main experimental results, the modeling and integration, derive some conclusion and then um, uh, show the next steps that has been done and they're actually uh, ongoing uh, on this technology and this process. So this is a technology based on a dynamically packet bed reactor and based on chemical looping. So how it works, basically imagine uh, one reactor filled with a certain material. In this case, we use metal oxide, which can be nickel, iron, mostly is the one that has been tested, but other material can also be considered. Then we feed air, and while we feed air, what's happening is that the, the metal is going to get oxidized, so it becomes nickel oxide, for instance. This is a very exothermic reaction, so the temperature of the bell will rise up quite uh, quickly, quite high. The reaction front, in this case, is much faster than the heat front. So what is happening is that when the bed is fully oxidized, a lot of heat is stored inside the bed, which is basically what you can see in this graph here. Now, we, we, we switch the valve, we start to feed another fuel gas, which can be an off gas available in a plant, I will show in a second. And what happened in this case is that the material will get reduced, but because the heat of reaction is uh, um, roughly close to zero, the maximum temperature of the bed is not really changing during the, um, during the reduction step. And what happened is that we produce CO2 and H2O at the outlet of the, of the system. Now, the combination of these two reactions is a combustion, so we have overall heat generated. So what we do with this heat? Well, the plan is to use for uh, an endothermic reaction, which in this case is reforming. So we feed methane and steam, or methane and CO2, and we produce singles. So that's the general concept we are working on. And basically, if you can imagine this concept uh, here reproduced, so with this three reactor, you can see that there is quite a lot of flexibility in the way to operate the system. So the first flexibility comes from the um, feedstock. So we can use any uh, natural gas, refinery gas, gas processing from fossil-based, fossil fuel-based fossil fuel feedstock, but we can also combine with some renewable-based gases, which is the case of biomethane or biowaste. On the other end, because we produce singles out of our reforming, we can also combine for, with different types of products. So one could be hydrogen. So basically, we combine with water gas shifted PSA, we get hydrogen, and we can also go for ammonia because we have pure nitrogen and hydrogen to be combined together. We can work on gas to liquid. So we could actually use the singles to produce methanol or liquid fuel. They are also very important. They're playing an important role in the, in the coming years, especially for transportation. And another application is also still the carbonization because this is a typical singles used for a direct reduction of iron. So you can understand that this technology has the potential to be used on different sectors. Now, let me go through some results. So what we did is that we tested two different material, iron-based and nickel-based. What you see here is, is nickel-based uh, results of, uh, um, are the results from nickel-based. We filled a bed, which we have in our lab, of up to 400, 450 grams of material, and we start to operate oxidation, reduction, and reforming. Now, what you see here is the, the results of breakthrough cures of oxidation, working at different pressure, different temperature, and the same is happening here. This is the case of reduction, where you operate at different temperature. Main uh, results here, that's uh, basically the solid temperature, uh, initial solid temperature must be higher than 500 during the oxidation to make the bed uh, showing a proper uh, breakthrough. 
uh, while we increase the flow rate of the of the um, of the um, of the gas, we can actually approach conditions which are very close to industrial uh, scale process, which is one meter per second uh, superficial gas velocity. And we, we could operate up to five bar. And uh, that's at the moment the limit with our pipeline, but we are able to go up to 10 bar hopefully very soon. And uh, because, the, as I said before, the, re- the oxidation is a delta T, which is exothermic, we recorded a temperature rise, which is 400 degrees Celsius. But effectively, what happened in our bed is that we add the material to get a, a much higher temperature. And the main difference is because uh, there is a, a thermal inertia between the solid reactor, the, bed, the world of the reactor, the thermal well inside the bed. So that's actually the, the, what our 1D to 2D model uh, demonstrates is that the temperature rise was actually higher than the one that we recorded. So about the endothermic part, so we, what we did in that case is that we had the bed at high temperature, so we start to feed uh, methane uh, and CO2 uh, um, um, feed gas, and we use different temperature and different pressure as well. And the main uh, results here is that this reaction is thermodynamic, uh, it's controlled by the thermodynamic equilibrium. It's a very little change in the final composition. And you can see a temperature drop in the thermocouple over the time, which are all over the bed. And that's basically because we have a um, reduction in the, in the temperature. Therefore, there is a heat removal effect, which is what we expect. An interesting uh, result that is coming from this project is, a, is a, a new application of the process, which is more related to uh, uh, the, the use of uh, CO2 and green hydrogen, because we need to have an endothermic reaction. So another endothermic reaction is actually reverse water gas shift. And what we did is that we tried to uh, use reverse water gas shift as a cooling stage. And we, uh, we did this with the using iron-based oxygen carrier. Uh, overall, we could perform a full cycle, so a combination of oxidation, reduction, and reforming, uh, while keeping the furnace temperature at 600. And what was very interesting in uh, uh, this experimental campaign is that we could clearly see the breakthrough. So you can re- easily see the breakthrough of oxidation, reduction, and everything about reform. So that's what we actually would like to have in our plant in a large-scale process. And another very important point was that how the temperature evolved inside the bed while moving from one step to another one. So we start with the blue line. After the oxidation, we got the green line. So we see that the bed was a higher temperature. Then we did the reduction. We saw a temperature decrease, but that's mostly due to heat losses. And then while we were doing reforming, we basically got all the temperature down until the initial temperature ready to start the new one. Very quickly, I will go to process performance. Uh, There are some papers where you can get more detail on that. Um, But so in terms of CO2 emission, we could reduce the CO2 uh, up to 98% from those existing process. We did testing, we did uh, analysis for hydrogen, methanol, ammonia, and fissure tops for large-scale plant. In terms of economics, uh, again, I will suggest you to uh, go more. You can ask if you want more detail, but... You can see also results published in a previous paper. Uh, main uh, results are coming from a reduction of the uh, capital cost. Uh, the, basically, those reactors will save uh, cost in terms of um, uh, capital, as well also some reduction in the cost of operating condition. And we ended up to have a, a cost of CO2 avoidance, which is uh, significantly lower than existing system. Another important point is also how this technology could be used for small scale. So we did a study on under 30 normal cubic meter hour plant. And what we did is that we combined together the dynamic operation of our process with the dynamic operation of PSA, and we put the simulation together. So this will be the case of a single small scale standalone on-site generator uh, for hydrogen. So some conclusion. Um, well, there is a momentum for hydrogen and CCUS. That's one of the main uh, positive messages we have learning uh, today. And blue hydrogen, in general, renewable hydrogen, it's a part of the solution for uh, uh, climate change. But this is imperative for energy-intensive industry. So we cannot think this is not an option for that. Chemical looping is a 
it's an option also at high pressure. So packet bay reactor are uh, suitable for that. They can go up to five. We have been tested up to five bar for more than thousand hours using batch of 400 to 500 grams material provided by Jones and Mati. Uh, Techno economics looks very fav favorable uh, so far. And uh, the technology is very modular and flexible in terms of feedstock and products. So there are also some uh, potential business case which could cover um, glass industry, food industry, or small industrial boiler. Next step is to move to pilot and demonstration. Uh, something has been done uh, thanks to this, the results of this project. So we are uh, in a project uh, on uh, gas, where gas solid chemical looping reactor are going to be scaled up for steel decarbonization. That's a, a C4U Horizon 2020 project. Manchester is leading, uh, we are leading a project on uh, a gle glycerol chemical loop in reforming to produce sustainable aviation fuel, which is the Glamour project. Uh, Total Energy is funding a new PhD student uh, working on um, the development of the technology. And we, uh, we got also some funding uh, that will be more uh, information will be released in May 2022 uh, from BASE. So thanks to, first of all, thanks all to the team. It's, uh, it's thanks to them that everything was possible uh, despite the pandemic. And thanks a lot to the uh, project partner and collaborator who have been uh, very actively engaging in uh, helping to scale up this technology. And finally, thanks to all the financial support that has been provided. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Amazing. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. I'm going to shuffle over here. I've been very quiet online with the questions. So let's open up to the room. Go for it up the top there again, please. Um, you mentioned scale up. What's the next sort of scale that you're looking to go towards? Um, so we, we are trying to go in the scale of uh, 100 to uh, 300 kilowatt of um, hydrogen production in term, as a thermal output. That's the case where we could go for a longer term project. Otherwise, the next step that we are uh, trying to target with this new funding arriving for a second uh, stage is uh, a bit smaller. So it's uh, in the order of 20 to 30 kilowatt hydrogen uh, thermal output. Any other questions? Is that a stretch or an arm up? <laughs> yeah, that, oh, yep, we've got one down here. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so I've got two questions, I think. Um, which I'd like to ask. One is regarding the feedstock that you've used. So I assume in the next phase, you're looking at other feedstock. You currently just use natural gas, I assume? Yeah, so that's an option. So with the feedstock we have been using so far are, <clears throat> uh, well, synthetic natural gas. So we, yeah. we made our own mixture. Yeah. Um, we have done uh, quite some uh, testing on combining methane and CO2. So this could be seen also as a kind of bio synthetic biogas. Um, and glycerol. We have also used glycerol for, uh, uh, for the Glamour project. We are, what we are doing is that we are trying to do glycerol to syngas. So we do glycerol reforming. So we are also using a quite uh, uh, sure, uh, of glycerol in water. Uh, for the glycerol reforming. So for the Johnson Matthews supplied catalyst, so yeah. they'll have a range, right? For different feedstocks, the heavier the feedstocks uh, for reforming. They just give us a material and we use with different feedstock, the same okay. material. Yeah, because that's one thing we, I think might be useful to look at as well. Yeah. Well, the material development is something that we, is always ongoing. Yeah. But for, the, for this project in particular, what we wanted to demonstrate is that things works. So we use a material that was already developed. We didn't optimize the material yet. So, I mean, we, we are working on that. Uh, there are uh, people which are working on, um, on that part. But what we want to do is that if there is an existing oxygen carrier or catalyst for reforming, and if we put this material and we use in uh, reduction oxidation reforming, how does it perform? And it turns out that the nickel material we tested after 500 hours of operation, the material didn't lose any reactivity in the reforming capacity, and the oxygen carrier capacity from redox reduction and oxidation was, was maintained almost constant. So there's a very marginal decrease. So 
material can be optimized. So we could work on, uh, we are working, for instance, on mixed oxide because changing the, um, the mixture will, we want to decrease the nickel content and increase other oxygen carrier content, which are cheaper. So that's one of the line we are working. We want to try to make the material uh, being able to operate at a lower temperatures as well. So, yeah. Um, okay, that's good. Um, uh, the next question I would ask is regards to the economics you show. Yeah. So would it be, would I be correct in saying this is sort of the approach that you'll see is for modularized approach? So would it be for the reactors would be a same size reactor repeated again. Uh, no. is, is that the, how is that done? What, what's so the understanding it, behind it? So it's, uh, it depends because obviously for the large scale plant, we, we are looking more to reactor, which might be three to five meter uh, reactor diameter up to 20 meters reactor length. But we are talking about very large scale processes. Uh, the methanol plant is uh, like three gigawatt thermal input uh, plant. While for small scale, I don't have the results, but in this case, we were using for the 130 normal cubic meter hour. Our idea was to make something big, but not that big that we couldn't fit inside a, a skid. So it's, it's only where we try to minimize the, the overall uh, size of the reactor. So if I'm not wrong, the uh, reactor of the chemical loop in here were like half meter diameter and maybe three meters length. That was the, the size we were, uh, we were considering for... Uh, for that case. So the point is that if you increase the size of the reactor, um, what is changing is the amount of material and the amount of, of, of gas that you can flow inside the bed. So you can, you can have different reactor operated in parallel that will make the overall plant works continuously. Thank you very much. And if there's any more questions anyway, you can take it into the coffee break, which I think we've managed to shave some time back in to before we um, kick off with the next session. So thank you once again to all our fantastic speakers. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.